mandate of art museums is to display their collections, preserve them as long as possible, carry out scholarship, and to educate the public. And some of these mandates, while being philosophically equivalent, are nevertheless contradictory, and so it requires a balancing act. The fundamental problem with preservation and display is that the display environment sets up the conditions of inevitable slow decline and deterioration. Light cannot be ever made 100% safe. Lighting itself imparts energy to surfaces of objects and artworks, inducing damage. So compromises have to be made. And those compromises can be optimized by selecting a light source, by tailoring a light source, by sculpting its spectra in such a way that the energy that is projected to artworks is only that which is required for color viewing and viewer satisfaction. In 2002, we basically pulled together all of the people within the conservation field, conservators and conservation scientists, who knew a great deal about museum lighting, and basically asked them what we should do. As a result of that meeting, uh, we decided to investigate several aspects, one of which is the creation of special light sources. So we became involved with Professor Carl Dirk at UTEP to explore filters that could go over light sources that would produce the kind of light quality that we were after. The main objective is to come up with lighting that would reduce photochemical degradation of artwork. The question was, even after we came up with a mathematical solution, was whether it was practically technically solvable. And the practical technical solution uh, comes down to the filters that would restrict the light that comes from existing lighting. And we knew that that technology did exist, and when we applied that technology to this problem, we came up with a technological solution, a filter which met the tolerances of the mathematical solution extremely well. While we had all the computational abilities to design lighting for light-sensitive objects, all of that computation, all of that technology, all of that would be virtually useless if we produced a filter that didn't look good to the viewer. So we built an experimental facility that allows us to use human assessors to evaluate the quality of the light filters that we've built. Essentially, we have two galleries. One is designed to use only traditional lighting with no filtration. The other is set up identically with our filters. And what we do is we ask the assessor just to walk between the two galleries as if they were looking at two galleries in a regular museum. Then they would fill out a questionnaire that would ask them about what they thought they saw, about color, about brightness, about tint. When doing color assessment, it's important that your assessors have average color vision. We give them standard tests with colored dots, but we also give them a color matching test that's rather rigorous. After several years of testing human assessors, we could confirm for the first time that the full color spectrum required by the human visual system to see color accurately was delivered by those filters, even though they projected less than half the total energy of an incandescent light bulb. In conjunction with the building and testing of the filters, we also assembled exposure facilities that tested the actual fading rate on sets of prepared pigments and dyes. Our testing, comparing filtered and unfiltered light, clearly shows that many pigments will fade very much slower with our filtration. After all the aspects of the research had been finished and the filters were made, the final step is to put them into a real museum environment, step back, and watch how people respond to them. We chose to use the George O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico as the partner for this. As part of our collaboration, we brought a series of George O'Keefe watercolors to our laboratories in California to do microfading testing directly on them. This was designed for several reasons. One, it helped to ensure that the filters were going to be particularly good for these watercolors, but also segregated out which of the watercolors were more sensitive than the others. That requires directly accessing color sensitivity on objects themselves. This technique has been developed 
at Carnegie Mellon University by Dr. Paul Whitmore. It essentially involves using a very powerful, very tiny beam of light directed on a portion of an object and then simultaneously fade and measure color change at the same time. If you do it very carefully and you do it very precisely, you can derive information on sensitivity virtually non-destructively. First of all, we have the largest collection of works on paper by George O'Keefe of any museum in the world. And secondly, we have the most outstanding examples of her watercolors that she did between 1916 and about 1920. We're very lucky that these watercolors are so fresh in the sense that they are of a character and quality that seems comparable to how they must have looked when she painted them. Now our question is, how can we keep these watercolors looking like this? At the same time, making them available to the general public. So you can only expose these watercolors to a certain amount of light before much of the watercolor pigment will change, become discolored, and in some cases even disappear. So what we'll be doing in conjunction with both of these institutions, the Getty and the University of Texas, is to develop these filters and gauges by which we can really understand how we can exhibit these watercolors and for how long, and which of their colors really are sensitive to changes. It allows the general public to enjoy these watercolors much as they looked when O'Keeffe painted them originally. For our most light sensitive objects, like O'Keeffe's Nude Series 12 here, the Getty analysis in the University of Texas El Paso filters enable us to essentially snap on a permanent glass filter on the front of a light bulb and eliminate 55% of the total energy hitting that artwork. All we're going to do is simply loosen the hood, open the hood, snap on the filter, and the work is done. From the beginning, we've disseminated information on the research that we've carried out here at Getty Conservation Institute, particularly in this project. We will do that in terms of publications, conference proceedings, and workshops. And it is hoped that these techniques will be adopted by many other institutions that will use them to preserve their collections for many years to come for the benefit of all of us.